Ladies and gentlemen, my name's Paul. Hope you're having an amazing day. I have a question for you. Do you like free graphics card performance and do you own an AMD GPU? Well, there's probably some really good news for you then because AMD's RSR or Radeon Super Resolution will be increasing performance for you for up to 70% with a caveat. We'll get into that in just a moment. If you've missed RSR, it's Radeon Super Resolution and AMD have now given us a sneak peek as to what we can expect from this technology. Essentially, it's a driver level implementation of FSR or Fidelity FX Super Resolution, which is basically a spatial upscaler. And it's actually been pretty successful, that is FSR. And uh, yeah, FSR, DLSS have both seen a lot of support with games developers, but the key is that a game developer needs to support it. So if you're playing an older game or a developer just chooses not to support that specific technology, well, you're just SOL. And of course, this driver level implementation then doesn't require that. It basically is just a toggle in your, well, GPU, driver control panel. AMD have already kind of been beaten to the punch here by NVIDIA, who actually have had the feature in their drivers for absolutely ages, um, which was a rather counterintuitive name of sharpening. But then since then, NVIDIA did quite a kind of hubbub and, you know, renamed it to NIS. And I actually covered this quite recently. Um, but yeah, now AMD are doing much the same thing. Now, they've basically said that the driver release is going to be occurring in Q1, but haven't given a specific release date. To my understanding, hearing things through the grapevine, it's because basically they're doing final Q&A testing. Again, it's quite a tall order. One of the caveats for this technology, it does require exclusive full screen. So basically, if you're someone who likes to play things in like a borderless window or like a, you know, or just a small window on your screen, then, well, that's not going to work. But anyway, yeah, the performance metrics are pretty impressive, up to 70%. And of course, it will also depend, in terms of the performance benefits, what resolution you're upscaling from and then to. For example, from 1440p to 4K, or are you going to be upsampling from, let's say, 1662p to 4K or whatever? Now, there is a very interesting note here at the end of the uh, sneak peek. Uh, you can see it at 47 seconds if you want to check out the video yourself. I'll try to remember to link it in the description. But it says, as of January 2022, Radeon Super Resolution is compatible with Radeon RX 5000 series graphics and newer and works with games that support exclusive full screen mode they also uh, provide a caveat of what the testing conditions were here and they were running with a 4k capable monitor obviously a 5800x and an rx 6700 xt and windows 10 and yeah they were of course also showing with uh, radian super resolution on excuse me and the title they were showing off was warframe upscaling from 1440p to 4k and then of course they were comparing that versus a native image now yeah, most of that is not too interesting. What is interesting is the fact that they are admitting here that it's going to be RX 5000 or later. So this is contrary to what we have with FSR, which works in RX 480s or basically any Polaris-based architecture, and also Vega as well. So even if you're the owner of, say, a Radeon 7, you're probably not going to be able to use this, at least according to this disclosure. Uh, maybe it will be added later because they say as of January, so it's definitely possible that they could add it at a later date. And this makes me wonder a couple of things. Is it because the technology itself in terms of the upscaler has changed? Maybe there's better quality. It's kind of difficult to tell based on the limited gameplay we've got here. Or is there another specific reason that it doesn't work? Is it because you know, something on the card itself? Is it architectural? I don't know. It'd be interesting, though, to test this out in the future. Quite excited. There's an awful lot of awesome driver updates at the moment from both NVIDIA and AMD, and obviously this is really good. I suspect both companies are trying to pack as many driver features in as possible, given naturally we're going to be facing, um, that we'll say they're going to be facing off against Intel. But keeping on the subject of AMD just for a few moments longer, there is an actual couple of fascinating updates concerning AM5 and also Zen 4. 
I'll keep this fairly brief and I will also link the Anantech article for the first thing um, because there is a quite an extensive interview but basically speaking we now understand that uh, Raphael, which of course is Ryzen 7000 series, aka Zen 4 Ryzen, whatever you want to say, is not going to be utilizing TSMC's vanilla plain old 5nm processor. Instead, it's going to be using an optimized TSMC 5nm process. And they do actually mention that it is 5 gigahertz, as you can see on screen, and beyond. Again, I've heard that it could be hitting about 5.4 to 5.45 gigahertz. However, I don't know necessarily if that's accurate because a it's really early on so we could be seeing higher clocks or lower clocks depending on power consumption and stuff b that is overclocked speeds just to be really clear that 5.4 gigahertz apparently is overclocked although i'm not so certain if that's pbo as other words it's overclocking itself or whether that's user you know defined i honestly don't know so it'll be it'll be really interesting to see what uh, frequencies AMD do hit because there is definitely like a thing that frequency does matter you know just for example I recently uh, reviewed the 12400 I'm still doing some tests on it actually for a couple of other projects and it's kind of funny because you know my uh, 10900k in terms of clock frequency spanks the 12400 but yeah, the 12400, of course, demolishes it for a number of tests, single thread, obviously, but also a number of gaming tests as well. So, of course, clock frequency is, well, yeah. Either way, though, AMD have also clarified that the 2.2D, uh, excuse me, chiplets and 3D chiplets will be basically kind of tools in their chest. But furthermore, the APUs may actually release later on. So first things first, we'll see the CPUs and then the APUs will come after that, according to AMD. And we also have some leaked renders. This is courtesy of Igor's lab. I will, of course, uh, link his article in the video description. And these renders, they don't really go through a whole amount that we don't know already. So I won't spend too long uh, kind of going through them. But yeah, I mean, it's basically an evolution of sorts of of course, of any socket that we've seen ever before. Obviously, there is an increased pin count here by quite a considerable, uh, quite a considerable margin for the LGA package. So, obviously, the 1718 uh, pins here. This is because of things such as DDR5 memory, which obviously you know increased bandwidth. So that is going to require all of those additional pins to communicate all that data. But it's going to be a very interesting socket, I suspect. I, you know, AM5, AMD have already confirmed is going to be a long life platform. So that includes, of course, Zen 5 as well. Oh boy, there's a lot of AMD news. Just actually a really quick thing um, concerning Ryzen 5000 on X370 boards. So ASRock have actually released a BIOS for X370 boards to support Ryzen 5000 series CPUs. So for example, you could plonk a 5600X or whatever on one of these boards. I haven't actually got an X370 board from um, ASRock personally, so I can't test this. I do have a couple of X370 boards from other vendors. So hopefully this is a sign of things to come that other companies such as, for example, oh, I don't know, MSI and Gigabyte and Asus and whomever actually start to release these BIOSes because that's good. Now, there is definitely an argument that the 300 series boards, whether that's the B boards or the X boards, were not made perhaps as high quality as the 4 or 5 or whatever series. And there are some reasons behind that. You know, the most obvious is, at the end of the day, I think a lot of motherboard manufacturers, their, their confidence in the boards was not... Yeah, it was kind of low. And so they didn't necessarily produce them to the highest quality. And, you know, that's just kind of how it was. Because AMD at the time, don't forget their market share was absolutely titchy. It was tiny. Uh, and there was a lot, of, a lot of hesitancy, a lot of... You know, let's just be honest. Like... I think many would agree that the first generation of Ryzen, there was an awful lot of hype, 
particularly when we were learning about the number of CPU cores and the fact it had SMT and all of this stuff, there was an awful lot of hype, but there was also a lot of like, can AMD really pull this off? Because remember, it was a ground up design and they did, they, 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 they knocked it out of the park. Um, and clear, clearly since then, you know, motherboard vendors have been absolutely amazed with how well AMD have handled things. It's, it's absolutely excellent. So yeah, I, I think, you know, a lot of folks might say, well, if you've got like a 300 series board, you may not even get the full clock frequency, that so memory frequency out of this, because ideally like a Zen 3 CPU, ideally you want like, well, 3200 you can kind of get by with, but ultimately you want 3600 or above however i think that honestly having this option is always a good thing because first of all if you have like a lower end cpu that can always be good like 5600 and you might have a board that does clock fairly high the second thing uh, and you know there's also things like power delivery um, which is a totally separate ball game but there is also the thing of like let's say for sake of discussion you have a 5600X right now, just for sake of discussion. And then you're like, well, you know what, my, um, I want an upgrade. And so you buy a 12900K or you buy Zen 4. And then you decide to just give your processor to your friend Bob. And Bob has, you know, one of these boards. And it's basically a drop in. Yes, sure. Okay. They're going to be losing a few percent in performance. But, eh. Okay, you know, if they, you know, if they don't have so much money or whatever, or maybe you even want to use it like a home theater system, it's just a drop in. At the end of the day, these are always good options, at least in my personal opinion. And the final thing that I want to discuss in this video actually concerns PCIe 6.0, as the full specification has been released to members. Actually, a couple of you messaged me on Twitter asking if I'd seen about this, and well, yeah, I thought I would throw it into this video, as it's pretty interesting. So um, I'll start with the memory bandwidth slide first, and PCIe speeds slash feeds Pick your bandwidth. I have no idea why I've said it in such a time, but there we go. Um, and you can see yourself these specifications here. Now this, and it's very important to remember here that PCIe 6 is basically fully backwards compatible. So for example, if you have a PCIe 5 device, it will work on PCIe 6 and so on and so on. But you can see the absolutely ridiculous amount of giga transfers per second for PCIe 6. So uh, we've got 64 GTS, uh, for, PC, um, for PCIe 6, that's of course assuming you've got a 16 lanes. Naturally, this is basically doubling the bandwidth of PCIe 5, basically, which in turn doubled it from PCIe 4, and in turn, well, you know what, I won't continue, you kind of get the idea. But um, it's actually quite amusing to see the PCIe 6 roadmap as well, because, um, I mean, I, I kind of feel like yeah, like I've gone in a time machine here just a little bit um, to look at the bandwidth figures of the like early PCIe, uh, sorry, PCIe, I wish, to see the early PCI bandwidth figures, you know, the early implementations of like 0 0.13. I mean, damn. And, uh, you know, like the early days where you had like just, yeah, it, it was measured in megabytes per second. And obviously that was more than enough for the for the graphics accelerators of the time, like Voodoo 2s or whatever. Um, and then obviously they kind of diverged from the PCI standard for a bit with AGP, and that kind of went for a while. And obviously now we're back on PCIe, which is, you know, the kind of default communication protocol across a plethora of devices. Of course, it's not just in your PC, which I'm sure most of you guys know, but there is some other things as well. I'll quickly read this over and then, uh, yeah, PCIe 6.0 specification, industry significance and major takeaways. I'm sorry, I'm in a really weird mood. Don't blame me. Uh, next generation performance, PCIe 6 technology is cost effective and scalable. Up to hundreds of lanes in a platform, industry leading features. So we see a um, PCIe technology has served as the de facto interconnect of choice for nearly three decades. The PCIe 6 specification adds new innovative features such as PAM4, FLIT and FEC. 
I think that's how you pronounce it. I'm going to, I'm going to say it's FEC. While continuing to meet industry demands for high speed, emerging markets and applications, and of course it brings high bandwidth and low latency to data intensive markets like HPC, data centers, artificial intelligence, and so on and so on. And yeah, so we're basically, the, the, the Cliff Notes version here is that uh, we have uh, double the bandwidth, as I just mentioned a moment ago, and we also get low latency. So we have a flow, um, fixed size flow control units flit. So this is basically for the encoding. And then we have lightweight um, forward error correction, that's FEC, F-E-C, and then pulse amplitude modulation with four levels. So that's, of course, PAM4. So uh, finally, and I, I've just mentioned this anyway, but again, there is backwards compatibility. So this is, well, you can see the roadmap and the dates yourself. It's going to be really interesting to see how the industry move forward uh, with this because we were stuck on PCIe for what felt like an eternity or three. Um, and, you know, a lot of graphics cards now still don't fully take advantage of PCIe uh, 4, and that's putting it kind of mildly. So it'll be curious, actually, to test out the 6500 uh, from AMD because we only have four lanes of PCIe uh, 4. Uh, so I wonder if running at times 3 is going to kind of impact performance. Although, of course, the GPU is not exactly super duper quick anyway. So my guess is it's probably going to be marginal, but we'll have to test it. With that said, thank you very much for checking out the video. I will see you soon. Take care of yourselves. Bye for now.